Uh, this is Dr. Wilder for Great Plains Laboratory. This is the Great Plains Laboratory complimentary webinar that's given once a month off of their website. Let me just check one thing here real quick. Okay. <clears throat> so in this presentation, I thought what we would talk about is evaluating, well, I guess answering the question, why? Why evaluate, you know, and treat digestive system problems that are commonly seen in autism? Why is that so important? Because um, there's a lot. There's a lot of issues to consider. This particular talk, um, honestly, could be an entire seminar. We could fill up an entire weekend seminar on just certain aspects of what's causing digestive system problems and then leading to other problems. Seeing autism, whether it's attention problems, focusing issues, sleeping problems, behavioral problems, et cetera, it all, in some kids, not everybody, but it all could link back in some part to a dysfunctional problem in the gut. So let's talk about that. Okay, what are called comorbid conditions? The Centers for Disease Control here in the United States recognizes significantly that autistic individuals tend to have a high prevalence of certain type of underlying problems, whether it's asthma or allergy issues, sleep problems, headaches, for example, seizure disorders, and gastrointestinal problems. And the gastrointestinal problems are significant. I mean, if you get into the entire list of things that could be going on in the GI system, what you see here on the screen is actually just a partial list. So they are, they are major comorbid problems from stomach inflammation to gastritis, to gastroesophageal reflux disease, to colitis, to irritable bowel, even small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, where we get normal overgrowth, I should say overgrowth of normal intestinal or colonic bacteria in the small bowel can be found in this population. Constipation issues are huge, food sensitivity and allergies, overgrowth problems, candida problems, mold, as well as bacterial imbalances are quite significant. What about the prevalence? Well, there's been many studies that have looked at the prevalence of GI issues in autism. This was one almost 10 years ago, actually over 10 years ago now, where they looked at 50 children in each group, who uh, a group that were neurotypical, some who are developmentally delayed, some who are autistic, and found actually that the neurotypical kids had some GI problems, about 28%, but the autistic kids had much, much higher problems of GI issues and worsening problems with regards to behavior. And this has led many within the autism community to realize that we have to look at the GI system as a causative, if not, or a contributing factor to certain behavioral problems. Because if psychotropic medications are just being thrown at children for behavioral issues, attention problems, or sleep problems, and the, the gut, the gastrointestinal system is not being assessed, you're not gonna get very far. Now, I'm not saying that all behaviors, all sleeping problems, all cognitive issues are related to a gut problem. But the digestive system imbalances cause enough problems for a significant proportion of individuals with autism, you have to look, okay? It, it's something that warrants taking a look at and seeing where the puzzle pieces may come together and how that might correlate to other issues. So when we think about the digestive system, we really need to think about it in totality, okay? It's not just the intestines. Digestion for all of us begins in the mouth. Okay, in the release of digestive enzymes in the mouth. And then the next phase is what's happening in the stomach with the production of hydrochloric acid that's necessary to help break down our proteins. The pancreas is involved in digestion. The liver is involved in digestion with the production of bile acids. In fact, bile acids being produced from the liver are incredibly important to help neutralize the acids that are coming into the small intestine from the stomach. And the bile acids produced from the liver are also a stimulus to the pancreas to produce digestive enzymes. 
So then we head into the small intestine and then eventually into the large intestine, which is sort of the final route of toxin elimination once we've already digested and absorbed the nutrients from our food. So there could be dysfunction throughout the entire system. Stomach acid gradually increases as we eat our meal. Okay, so when the, the stomach acid amount is elevated, it normally takes about 20 to 30 minutes for this to occur after eating. Now, that's important because acid is also our first line defense against pathogens entering our body or entering our, our stomach before it heads into the small intestine. One of the things that tends to shut down stomach acid production is sugar. So kids who are over consuming sugar will tend to have lower release or production of hydrochloric acid. This is one of the reasons in, in integrative nutrition, they often talk about avoiding eating fruit, for example, with other foods, specifically protein foods. So if you're eating an apple at the same time you're eating a piece of meat, you could potentially alter some, in some regards, the production of hydrochloric acid that's necessary to digest the meat. Also, it's often recommended to try and eat the protein portion of your meal first to help stimulate hydrochloric acid production in the stomach. Well, if we have dysfunctional problems in the stomach because of poor digestion, for example, that can lead to maldigestion issues that occur in the small intestine. And we're at risk, all of us, not just kids, we're all at risk for what's called small intestine bacterial overgrowth, where we can start to get bacterial accumulation in the small intestine and the situation becomes worse when we have maldigestion because the maldigestion produces gases like hydrogen and methane, which damage the small intestine. And the small intestine is broken into three parts. It's one long tube, but regionally it has different functions. The duodenum is the, is the area closest to the stomach. It's where we dump or release a lot of the pancreatic enzymes that are being produced from the pancreas and the bile acid coming from the liver. They all enter the duodenum through what's called the common bile duct. The jejunum is the, the, the largest area or surface area of the small intestine. It's the area that we're absorbing most of our nutrients. And then the ileum is the last part of the small intestine where the major seat of immunity is found. That's also a part of the small intestine that can be compromised in some kids with autism who have inflammatory bowel disease. It causes um, lesions in the ileum and causes a lot of intestinal inflammation. And when there is dysfunction in the lower part of the small intestine, it can affect what's called the ileocecal valve. The ileocecal valve is the valve that um, closes off the small intestine from the large intestine. So as the ileocecal valve opens, we're able to pass different debris through the ileocecal valve into the first part of the large intestine, which eventually moves on out in our stool. Small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is something seen in autism. It's not an easy test to get, unfortunately. For some kids, the ability to blow into a tube every 15 minutes for a couple hours is difficult for them to do to be able to adequately measure hydrogen and methane gas. This was a particular study that came out of the European uh, Child Adolescent Psychiatry Journal in 2018 though, that did show that compared to neurotypical kids, autistic kids in the study had a much higher rate of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, okay, 31% compared to 9%. And the, the SIBO was associated with worsening symptoms of autism, behavioral issues, for example. Whenever we have an overgrowth of, of bacteria in the small intestine, or perhaps we've got invasive candida, or we've got bacterial infections or parasitic infections, or ongoing food sensitivities, 
there's the potential for damaging the surface lining of the gut. These little hair-like structures called microvilli line the villi. The villi are these larger finger-like projections that are involved in nutrient absorption, helping to absorb carbs, proteins, and fats. And so this is an, these are structures that can be damaged over time, again, because of infection, chronic infection, as well as adverse food reactions. So celiac disease, for example, damages the surface lining of the gut. And when we damage the surface lining of the digestive system, we can alter the production of our main immune defense in the digestive system called secretory IgA. And deficiencies in secretory IgA are linked to inflammatory bowel disease, are linked to increased risks for intestinal cancers, um, are, are linked to increased problems of malabsorption. And whenever we alter immune function in the gut, well, it increases the potential for opportunistic infections, like clostridia infection, for example. Now, bowel inflammation can manifest from a lot of different reasons. You can have, I've seen kids who've had their an inflammatory bowel condition triggered because of an adverse reaction to a vaccine. Others, it's stimulated because of some underlying autoimmune problem. Others, it's because of chemical toxins. Others, it's because of food sensitivities, or it's a combination of factors. Diarrhea or constipation can be an indicator of bowel inflammation. That's not to say that in all cases, diarrhea or constipation is an absolute indicator, but those two are associated. Self-injurious behavior, food avoidance, poor absorption, poor growth can all occur because of inflammation in the bowel. One of the tests that's worth doing at some point in your assessment, whether you're a parent listening to this presentation or a health practitioner, is a comprehensive digestive stool test to get a visual on underlying imbalances in the gut, from bacterial problems to yeast overgrowth to inflammation markers and digestive markers. This is a, a comprehensive digestive stool test that Great Plains provides. It gives certain markers of inflammation. The calprotectin and the lactoferrin, for example, are very specific for inflammatory bowel disease. The secretory IgA marker on this test, when it's elevated, usually is elevated when there is some type of infection. It sometimes can be low in these tests when there's been long-standing inflammation, uh, but oftentimes when it's high, you gotta look for a source of infection. So the comprehensive digestive stool test is a, a good test to do. Behaviorally, we see that a lot of kids with a, intestinal problems, whether it's just intestinal pain from let's say gastritis or reflux, constipation, overgrowth syndromes from yeast or bacteria, children who are having some type of intestinal discomfort will oftentimes leverage themselves over furniture. This is a particular child leveraging themselves over the end of a table. And a lot of kids will do this to help relieve pain. They don't have the ability to tell you they're having pain, so you have to interpret it based on behavior. Also, they don't have enough upper body strength to sort of get enough relieving pressure themselves. Okay, so this can be an indicator of intestinal pain. Whenever there is pain, whenever there's inflammation, whenever there is constipation, discomfort, cramping, et cetera, it can, not always, but it can lead to behavioral problems. In some kids, it's aggressive behavior. In others, it's self-injurious behavior. So a constipation, by the way, is a, I've often seen over the years as a major trigger for that problem. The intrahepatic circulation system. This is an important concept to understand because what we're looking at here is our large intestine, also called the colon. And the colon is what receives um, uh, different 
whether it's toxins or leftover food stuff that's, that's exiting the small intestine is now leading into the large intestine. And the large intestine is responsible for reabsorbing much of the fluid that the small intestine is giving to it that prevents us from, from becoming dehydrated. And then the fecal matter that is now flowing through the gut, now accumulating in the large intestine, is bulking up the toxins and the leftover non-utilizable debris into the fecal matter, concentrating it, and we eventually will poop it out as stool. But when there is inflammation, when there is low colonic motility, for example, when there is constipation, there is an increased potential for reabsorbing toxins back into the body instead of getting rid of them. Because this occurs through the mechanism of portal venal return. Basically, the, the, the blood supply that is draining the, uh, I guess you say the substrates, if not chemicals coming from the large intestine, get taken right back to the liver. And many of those can then be taken back out into general circulation. So enterohepatic circulation is a normal process of the digestive system, but if there's a lot of toxicity involved, you can reabsorb some of the toxin. And that situation is generally always made worse when constipation is a problem. We know that probiotics you know, the bacteria that live in our digestive system, most of them live in the large intestine. We have about 10% or so live in the small intestine, play a significant role in digestive health, okay? They compete with opportunistic infections. They create a barrier effect along the surface lining of the gut. They stimulate the immune system like secretory IgA, for example. They can compete for nutrients for some of the pathogenic organisms. They help to bioconvert food stuff into utilizable nutrients. Okay, they reduce inflammation. They keep things in balance and they can also have a direct antagonistic effect on certain pathogens as well, like Clostridia or Candida. And so when the normal bacteria in the gut become compromised, whether it's from longstanding toxin exposure or antibiotic use or, or whatnot, well, it leaves the gut vulnerable overall to opportunistic infections. A comprehensive digestive stool test can give us some indication of diversity of bacteria. It's not going to analyze every single bacteria that's down there, but it can give a pretty good viewpoint of, are we dealing with a fairly diverse, I guess we'll call it the microbiome of the gut. In this particular slide, we see no growth bifidobacter, no growth, growth E. coli, no growth lactobacillus, no growth enterococcus. So this person is fairly devoid of a diversity of good bacteria. And because of that, they've got an overgrowth of opportunistic bacteria like Enterobacter and Klebsiella, not an ideal situation. That can lead to problems of invasive candida. Candida has the ability to, to become invasive, and it does so fairly rapidly because of different stressful events in the gut. Candida can grow hypha, for example, these, these tentacles that will, let me get a pen here, penetrate hold on, through the surface lining of a cell. It even can grow between cells. Okay, and so these, the, think of these tentacles like roots, you know, a, a, a weed in your, on your yard or in your garden is growing roots into the deeper aspects of the soil. You can't just cut off the head and expect the root to go away. We've got to be able to kill off these organisms in, in different stages, and sometimes that takes time. It, it, sometimes that takes months, if not longer, to be able to change the ecosystem of the gut in order to get a chronic candida issue under control. It doesn't always just happen in a couple of weeks of taking something like nystatin or some botanical remedy. This is why the ongoing yeast problems are such a challenge for some people because 
invasive yeast can lead to leaky gut. Leaky gut leads to increase uh, crossing of different toxins coming from the digestive system and now gaining access to the blood supply. In extensive situations of leaky gut can also lead to what's called a leaky blood-brain barrier. A leaky blood-brain barrier can lead to neurological inflammation because the tight junction structure that makes up the binding mechanism in the intestinal lining is very similar to the binding mechanism that keeps the blood-brain barrier intact. Candida produces a number of different compounds that can affect behavior, can affect attention, can affect language. Ethanol or alcohol is a byproduct of yeast metabolism. And in some cases, the behaviors can be severe. Fecal smearing is a rare event, but it can happen and I have seen it happen or my 20 years of experience now, or 20 plus years of experience in a few circumstances. Let me give you just a quick story. We're probably going back about seven, eight years ago now, um, when I was living in San Diego, California. Southern California is very prone to wildfires. And about four to five times per year, there is winds that blow from the desert westward towards the Pacific Ocean. They're called Santa Ana or the Santa Ana winds, and they cause a lot of dryness, throw a lot of debris into the air, and it's an incredibly risky, vulnerable time for wildfires. Well, one particular situation, there was a massive fire that was burning from the east mountains of San Diego County towards the Pacific Ocean, and the smoke was unbelievably intense. And one of the things, uh, I've seen occur over the years when we get Santa Ana's because allergy levels go up. Many autistic kids will tend to have problems with yeast, tend to have problems with candida as the candida becomes more um, a, a problematic in those situations. So in this particular scenario, there was a family that was living downwind from a lot of the smoke. They had a fairly severe autistic child, but he was fairly well controlled on a gluten casein free diet, low sugar free diet, uh, yeast diet, and antifungals. But once he got exposed to the smoke, about 40 out, 48 hours into that exposure, he started getting severe yeast behavior, goofiness, giddiness, silliness, inappropriate laughter, hyper, um, high self-stimulatory behavior that eventually pushed him over the edge to where he started fecal smearing. What that meant was that he was taking his own feces and smearing it all over his bathroom and his bedroom. Um, a very e e extreme circumstance related to a massive allergic sensitivity and you know, flare in yeast. So what I did, is I knew I didn't have time to just give a, a botanical or to give something like nystatin. So I actually gave a systemic antifungal called diflucan. And within about 48 to 72 hours, that fecal smearing behavior was gone. Eventually the fires were controlled, the smoke dissipated and disappeared, and he was able to get back to his normal routine. It wasn't like he was he became non-autistic. It's just that the diflucan had such a dramatic shift and change in his overwhelming response to yeast that he no longer had fecal smearing. And I've seen fecal smearing in other circumstances that have has been alleviated with a diflucan too. Well, these organisms can also produce other chemicals that can affect individuals with autism in unique ways. These chemicals can actually alter the function of the methylation cycle. And, and if you've heard some of my presentations before, we know that the methylation cycle is critically important. It's linked to the immune system. It's linked to language. It's linked to environmental awareness. It's linked to behavior. It's linked to sleep. It's linked to a lot of things. It's linked to the ability of our body to produce chemicals that are involved in detoxification. And one of the, the steps in methylation is an enzyme called methionine synthase. 
Methionine synthase is what converts homocysteine to methionine. It is also linked to the folate cycle and it plays a big deal with regards to methylation support. But methionine synthase is very sensitive to the presence of toxins, whether it's heavy metal toxins um, as well as ethanol. Okay, ethanol that is consumed in a beverage or um, that perhaps is being produced by yeast. So just the presence of yeast toxins could adversely affect methylation by adversely affecting this particular switching enzyme called methionine synthase, which means that yeast coming from the gut could be affecting methylation. And yeast occurring in the digestive system because of inflammation, because of maldigestion, because of poor immune function in the gut. Another bacteria that wreaks havoc in the digestive system is Clostridia bacteria. And what's unique to the story of Clostridia is certain toxins that different types of Clostridia bacteria produce. HPHPA and 4-creosol, for example, are two toxins that different Clostridia bacteria produce that directly damage this enzyme called dopamine beta hydroxylase. And dopamine beta hydroxylase is what's necessary to convert dopamine to norepinephrine. When the enzyme is blocked, we can start to see an increase of dopamine within the nerve cells of the brain and nervous system. That's a big problem because Dopamine is a very reactive chemical biochemically. Dopamine breaks down into a chemical called dopamine oquinone. Dopamine oquinone is seen by the body as a toxin and tries to get rid of it. Dopamine oquinone can lead directly to brain cell death. It can damage dopamine receptors, which has certainly a link to Parkinson's disease, for example. It can rob the body of glutathione. We need glutathione to manage the different types of toxins that we're all exposed to. So glutathione deficiencies can occur because of excess dopamine, which can occur um, because of the presence of Clostridia bacteria in the digestive system. And that's why something like the organic acids test is a fundamental test to have because the different markers for candida are present on that test, as well as the different markers for Clostridia bacteria. Candida, as well as Clostridia and other toxins, chemical toxins, mold toxins, can all affect mitochondrial function. And mitochondria, these energy factors in our cells that churn out a, a high amount of a chemical called ATP. ATP is the cellular energy currency. It's like money, okay? We need money in order to run and, and move our economy. Well, the economy of our body is the normal functioning of all the different organ systems and all the different organ systems need the energy currency money called ATP. Another layer to understanding problems in the digestive system of kids with autism is how it can also affect the brain and nervous system in other ways. And that brings us to this larger discussion of something called the autonomic nervous system, the, the balance between the sympathetic and the parasympathetic. A very simplistic way of thinking of this is the sympathetic is the accelerator, the parasympathetic is the brake. And we, in order to drive our car, we need both, right? We need an accelerator to get us going, but we need a brake to slow us down. Um, and too many individuals who are in a chronic state of stress, including individuals with autism, have too much sympathetic nervous system dominance. They are constantly pushing on the accelerator. 
and that can generate anxiety problems, it can generate sleeping problems, it can generate behavioral issues, focusing the attention problems, impulsivity problems, compulsive behavior. In extreme situations, it could be even lead to things like psychosis. The gateway, or I shouldn't say the gateway, I guess the, 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 the fundamental aspect anatomically that's involved in the autonomic nervous system that has relationship to the gut as well as to the brain is the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve plays a big role for all of us. Ah, let me go back, sorry. Okay. And there is evidence that the vagus nerve is not just sending nerve impulses from the brain to the body. The, ner the vagus nerve is involved in taking uh, signaling information from the body back into the brain. It's called afferent information. In fact, 90% of the function of the vagus nerve is afferent. It's pulling in information from the peripheral system and relaying it back to the brain so the brain can interpret what's going on. And one of the areas that's highly involved in receiving this type of information is the cerebellum. The cerebellum is a part of the brain that's very much involved in coordinating motor and sensory information so that it helps to maintain what's called proprioceptive balance. It helps us to orient ourselves um, to our surroundings and to keep our balance physically, but it also has relay mechanisms that relay information to the sort of the inner part of our brain that's involved in emotional recognition, emotional control, and sensory processing. This particular paper was, was talking about how they were able to trace a, a neurotoxin being produced by Clostridia tetanus through the vagus nerve coming from the digestive system into the cerebellum. And the area that it attacked in the cerebellum was cells that produce GABA. GABA is an inhibitory amino acid that's necessary for regulating excess electrical activity in the brain. And when GABA receptor or GABA function is altered, there is usually a higher state of stress and a higher state of anxiety. Okay, so the GI system has a significant role in affecting the brain and vice versa. Okay, the imbalances in the digestive system, whether it's yeast or bacteria, can have relay mechanisms through the vagus nerve that can influence the brain. So we, it, it appears now that we not only can take toxins from our gut and drive them or bring them into the brain, potentially through the vagus nerve, we also know we can get peripheral responses too as things get absorbed from the gut into the bloodstream. Bacteria in the large intestine um, you know, make up what's called gram-positive and gram-negative bacteria. And in our large intestine, we actually have a lot of these gram-negative bacteria. Gram-negative bacteria, as part of their cell membrane, carry a chemical called lipopolysaccharide. Well, lipopolysaccharide um, can be a problem in an elevated amount because it can actually cause or stimulate inflammation. So E. coli and Proteus and Campylobacter, for example, Pseudomonas bacteria are what are called gram-negative bacteria. Lipopolysaccharide that sheds from its cell wall is a stimulator of different inflammatory chemicals called cytokines. In extreme cases, Lipopolysaccharide can induce insulin resistance. It can even induce microglia activation, the main immune cells in the brain. So an over accumulation of these, or growth of these gram negative bacteria could lead to excess lipopolysaccharide production, which leads to increased production of inflammatory immune chemicals which in the gut is problematic because it can damage the surface lining of the gut leading to leaky gut. 
okay? Though the lipopolysaccharide damages that tight junction structure that keeps the epithelial cells in the gut intact. Now, inflammatory bowel disease, severe infections, prolonged exercise can also be a stimulus of lipopolysaccharide. But if we have healthy liver function and we've got overall healthy digestion, we're able to manage the lipopolysaccharides that do get produced normally in the digestive system. But if we have a excess production of them, they can damage the tight junctions. This is a tight junction architecture, the unit within the gut, okay, that's helping to maintain epithelial integrity. This is the tight junction structure that makes up the blood brain barrier. So it's possible to have a leaky uh, gut, so leaky gut and a leaky blood brain barrier brought about because of bacterial imbalances, inflammation in the digestive system. When we have these types of reactions occurring, it, there is a possibility that it can start to damage the, the membranes that make up the cells of our body. And if this is happening in the brain or nervous system, that's certainly problematic because the cell membrane is what's involved in keeping an equilibrium between the inside of the cell and the outside of the cell. Also, the inner workings of the cell is what produces the proteins that regulate immune function and have other aspects with regards to our physical body. Plus, the, the cell membrane is what maintains the receptor sites for neurotransmitters or you know, electrolyte transport or electrical activity in the brain. Great Plains Laboratory has a test called the phospholipase A2 test. This is a urine profile that I recommend doing when you're doing an organic acids test because it is an indicator of inflammation when phospholipase A2 levels are high. Now, omega-3 fatty acids and vitamin E are known to inhibit phospholipase A2 levels. This particular chemical, though, when seen elevated, is real problematic because it's showing you that there is some type of systemic inflammatory problem that has the potential of affecting brain and nervous system function, as well as other cells in the body as well. I've often seen it elevated in kids who have bacterial infections, and we're now starting to see elevations of this with regards to individuals who are exposed to mold toxins. Where my mind goes in this whole discussion is if we're starting to see these types of inflammatory chemicals like phospholipase A2, there's also the possibility of these things triggering neurological inflammation, which we know already exists in some kids with autism. Unfortunately, if there's not a one single test to tell us, you know, you know, is there absolute brain inflammation going on or um, that is at least readily available. Most of these things come, you know, these are very sophisticated tests. They can require blood draws uh, and they're not universally high in all kids. But the neurological inflammatory aspect is important because it can have long-term damaging effects on particularly those areas in the brain related to cognition as well as speech. And much of it gets driven by these immune cells called microglia. In fact, microglia, as I mentioned before, can be triggered by lipopolysaccharides. That's what LPS is. And LPS, you know, for many individuals is being produced in the gut. Okay, because of an overgrowth of bacteria, um, dysfunction of the gut, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, there's a lot of potential reasons for it. That's why doing a comprehensive assessment of an organic acid test, of a comprehensive digestive stool test, and then also looking at doing the phospholipase A2 test to give us insight into some of these imbalances. I mentioned mold, okay, that we're starting to see now phospholipase A2 being associated with mold exposure. All of us are exposed to mold. None of us really totally 100% in a lifetime. 
In fact, all of us generally tend to get exposed to aspergillus mold. It's the most common mold in the environment. In high amounts, though, it can produce a toxin called aflatoxin M1, which can damage the gut. It can damage the digestive system. Now, these things can be found in corn, in milk, in eggs. Peanut and peanut butter are high potential sources of aflatoxin. So it's also carcinogenic. They're also damaging to the liver and the kidney. Now, aflatoxin M1 is even more toxic in the presence of mycotoxin, another mycotoxin or mold toxin produced by certain, uh, excuse me, certain uh, aspergillus mold as well as penicillium mold. Penicillium mold is very common in fruit, for example, like if you left an orange sitting on your uh, in a fruit bowl on your kitchen counter for a couple of weeks, it starts to turn that, that greenish blue mold that starts to grow. That's penicillium mold. And ochratoxin as well is immunotoxic. And you have to think that the gut is one of the largest immune organs that we have. Okay, it's in, It can suppress the production of secretory IgA, which then what? Increases the potential for invasive yeast, increases the potential for opportunistic bacterial infection, including Clostridia bacteria. So another tool for assessment, even though it seems non-related to gut function, is the mycotox profile, because you know that some of those mycotoxins can have a direct effect on digestive function. Glyphosate, okay, a lot of information coming out now about the toxicity of glyphosate. There's commercials online now. They're talking about if you've been exposed to glyphosate and you think your cancer was caused by glyphosate, call this number and this attorney group will help you. That's showing up more and more now. Well, glyphosate is definitely a problem, okay? Genetically modified foods were modified to tolerate glyphosate. Cotton, alfalfa, wheat, corn, soy, for example, these GMO based foods were modified so that they can handle the glyphosate because the glyphosate is used as a desiccant. It helps to kill off the extra green part of the plant, also gets rid of weeds, for example. The problem for us, as well as our kids, is that glyphosate causes a decrease of the ability of normal bacteria in the digestive system from utilizing certain amino acids. Tryptophan, tyrosine, and phenylalanine are amino acids that are very important for uh, nervous system function, for example, and overall growth. And so many animal studies are now showing that glyphosate exposed animals are now having microbiome problems where they're carrying a decreased ratio of beneficial to harmful bacteria, including salmonella and clostridium, including clostridia botulina. This is happening in cows as well as poultry. So another factor that can damage the balance is the gut. So in review, some lab tests to be comprehensive. An organic acid test to me is always essential because of the markers for candida, of the markers for mold that are in the gut, of the markers for bacteria and clostridia and mitochondrial imbalances, et cetera. A comprehensive digestive stool test is complementary to the organic acid test. It can give us a visual of bacterial diversity either good growth or no growth of certain bacteria give us markers of inflammation and digestion. So those two tests tend to go together. I've already mentioned the phospholipase A2. It's a urine test that can be added into an order for the organic acids test to give us some insight into this marker of inflammation that could be affecting brain, and, uh, brain function, for example. Glyphosate, I think, is, is uh, an important test to do along with the mycotox panel. 
to look at mycotoxins. Now, we didn't talk about the GPL tox test, this test regarding chemical exposure. That is an important test at some point to get as well, because there are certain chemicals on that test that as well could affect the health of the gut, as well as the health of the rest of the body and the brain and nervous system too. Food sensitivity is always an important thing to consider with ongoing digestive system problems. So the nice thing is Great Plains actually has a food IgG test, what's called a dried blood spot test. So this is actually a very comprehensive profile, but would provide a significant amount of information up front about where to go and what to prioritize regarding treatment. Now, we actually have a website called Lab Tests Plus labtestplus.com, where many of the Great Plains labs are available, including the ones I just showed you. Any lab that's ordered through Lab Test Plus comes with a personalized written review. I sit down with the test and I write out specific information regarding the markers on the test that have you know, relevance. I mean, I'll do that for the mycotox, the GPL tox, the phospholipase, the organic acid test, et cetera. There are other labs available on this website too from some other companies but we carry many of the labs from great plains so you can go to labtestplus.com if you need assistance in ordering labs let's talk about a few or some supplement options when we're dealing with intestinal pathogens i mean with bacterial overgrowth yeast overgrowth Many of these combination botanicals can work, work quite well. Uh, this particular one, berberine complex, comes from New Beginnings Nutritionals. Berberine is something that is commonly used in the treatment of small intestinal bacterial overgrowth because it has a good effect against those bacteria. It can also be effective against opportunistic candida as well. Now, this is a capsule, excuse me, these are tablets so you really have to determine whether a child can swallow these or not. Older kids use it a little bit easier, uh, but generally a well-tolerated type of product. New Beginnings also has the Candida Defense Formula. This, is, uh, this actually has some berberine in it, but it's got a number of other things that are a little bit more targeted towards Candida, like the Powdiarco, for example. This too is capsules, generally easier to give obviously to kids who can swallow capsules, teenagers or adults. For younger kids or patients who have a difficult time swallowing capsules, the yeast control packet can be quite useful. This is a, a, a packet of four different remedies. The idea is to rotate amongst these remedies about every five to seven days, okay? so. And that rotation can be relatively indefinite. I mean, the, the idea is to kind of rotate amongst them. And when you rotate amongst some of these botanicals, whether you're rotating every week or perhaps every couple of weeks, what that does is it limits or lessens the chances of resistance to those remedies by the yeast. So you're kind of switching things up, if you will. One thing to keep in mind when it comes to candida treatment i use the word candida and yeast interchangeably basically one thing to remember is that candida is a yeast it's a type of yeast what really works for for the candida problem is persistent and consistent therapy okay it's ongoing therapy it's not starting and stopping that usually doesn't work okay it means that you're either using something long term or you're rotating amongst different remedies but you're keeping after it. And sometimes that can be many months in pursuit of trying to get a handle on candida. There are some individuals where they need to constantly be on these remedies as an everyday intervention to keep their yeast in check. Um, I've had individuals who've been on nice statin, for example, for a number of years because it's just what their body required. So the one recommendation I would give is don't go into candida treatment thinking that it's just a two to four week process and you're gonna call it quits. Um, you gotta keep after it. And that's why repeating something like the organic acid test every you know, 90 days or so can be beneficial 
is it gives you a visual. Are you making headway? You know, are the yeast markers gone, for example? Another great remedy, which I use a ton of in my practice, is biocidin from Biobotanical Research. The great thing about this remedy is it is a, a combination product. They have liquid as well as capsules, and the liquids taste very good, okay? Um, most kids take them just fine, mixed in juice or water. Some kids take them right in the mouth without a problem. I can't promise that every single child out there is gonna take biocidin without some complaint, but by and large, most do. It also has effectiveness against different bacteria. We've used biocidin in small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. I've used biocidin even for certain parasitic infections. When it comes to clostridia infections, I've actually used biocidin with great success. Um, over the past you know, number of three, four years now, if not a little bit longer, in what I call a, 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 cip, a, a cyclical dosing program of biocidin, which has worked extremely well for clostridia bacteria. Um, New Beginnings Nutritionals carries biocidin. They not only carry the liposomal form, they carry the capsule as well as the regular liquid. In my experience, they've all been well tolerated, all effective. You might have a certain individual who's a little bit older who might prefer the capsules. They don't have a problem swallowing the capsules. Um, they actually have a toothpaste now for called dentalocidin, which is a, a great product. So you can contact New Beginnings Nutritionals, talk to one of the representatives about the biocidin products. You can also contact biobotanical research directly too. So um, these remedies are really one of my favorite when it comes to botanical intervention for a wide variety of pathogens. One of the other cool things about the botanicals, particularly the biocidin, is some of the studies that have been done, done showing its anti-biofilm properties. That's one of the built-in mechanisms naturally that mother nature provided with many of these botanicals is having an effect on biofilm, okay? The biofilm that candida and bacteria produce. This was a particular paper that came out a number of years ago where they were looking at different concentrations of biocidin to what are called biofilm bacteria and candida and the planktonic form. Planktonic would mean the independent cells. And across the board, there was very positive effect not only for the bacteria, but also the candida in its planktonic form and those that were embedded in a biofilm. This was a particular slide showing a significant reduction in the colony of, of, of independent pseudomonas and biofilm pseudomonas with just a 50% concentration of biocidin over a 24 hour period of time. This was looking at candida to a 25% concentration of biocidin over a 24 hour period of time, a significant reduction as well. And one thing to keep in mind is this was, these were culture studies that were only done for a day, okay, just 24 hours. When we're treating these types of issues, we're obviously treating for much longer than a day. Biobotanical research also has a new GI detox Plus, it's called GI Detox Plus. It's got some activated charcoal, some zeolite clay, some apple pectin, the humic and fulvic acids, for example, an all around good binding agent for intestinal toxins, whether the intestinal toxins are coming from small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, from bacterial imbalances in the large intestine, from clostridia, from candida, other yeast species, as well as mold. Also, the humic acid in the GI detox is a known in hip, um, a binder of glyphosate, for example. So uh, another nice thing to, to, to have in play for us in attempts to try to lessen the absorption of these intestinal toxins. Uh, biobotanical research carries this as well as the GI detox. I typically will have People take, you know, um, one capsule twice daily um, to try and keep the, the toxin levels low. 
This is another product I, I wanted you to be aware of. New Beginnings just started carrying this a couple months ago. It's called IgG powder. And what this is, is this is a immunoglobulin powder that helps to bolster immune function in the gut by reducing the toxic load that many of these pathogens produce. So for example, we were talking earlier about lipopolysaccharide, right? LPS being a component of gram negative bacteria at the cell wall. Well, this particular product can bind to the lipopolysaccharide and lessen its damaging effects in the gut and potentially its effects systemically. It even binds to the toxin A and B of clostridia and it can bind to different substances that are part of the cell wall of fungus that might be happening in the digestive system as well. So in my experience so far, this has been a well-tolerated supplement, seems to mix well in, um, uh, for kids to be able to drink and take. You can contact New Beginnings Nutritionals to get a little bit more information about this particular product. I am also available for ongoing question and answers through our website called autismrecoverysystem.com. This particular website has a forum. People post me questions through the general forum. They can also reach me th through private messaging as well to talk about products, to talk about testing recommendations, to talk about troubleshooting or other aspects with regards to biomedical intervention for autism. I have people who are on this site from all over the world. You can also just follow us with you know, general information on Facebook at Autism Recovery System on Facebook. Also part of the Autism Recovery System site is an entire biomedical course that was specifically designed for parents and caregivers of individuals with autism. It's over 10 hours of recorded lectures and videos. There's handouts, et cetera, in this particular course. So the Autism Recovery 101 course is, is part of the Autism Recovery System website. So uh, the website is a subscription, uh, monthly subscription, but once you get inside, I mean, all content is, is available, including the forum. So you can check that out at autismrecoverysystem.com. We also have another edition of our Autism Mastery course coming up here in a few weeks. This is a very in-depth course regarding biomedical intervention. Um, it's, it's run through our online academy called Integrative Medicine Academy. We, there's over 16 core modules of lecture material and hours of breakout lectures as well, along with uh, Q&A sessions to dive into material deeper. We do case studies, we do lab reviews, we talk about yeast and clostridia and parasites and gut problems and inflammation and methylation, um, detox, chemicals, heavy metals and molds and more. So this course is really an assimilation of material and experience that I've gained over two decades in, in working in this field. Uh, and I deliver that information in, in just a few short months to help speed along the process for health practitioners. This course is also open to parents or caregivers too. It's not closed, but the material is designed for healthcare practitioners. So anybody can take it, that's totally fine, but you just need to know going in that a lot of the material is, is designed for healthcare practitioners. There are course exams um, for those who wanna get continuing education credit, those are available too. And there's actually a certificate of completion that is sent out after the course is done, if you want that type of thing, after you've taken the exams, to show that you've gone through this particular course. So you can actually go to autismmasterycourse.com to learn more information. Our next course starts Tuesday, September 25th. There are, it is an early bird discount still available. If you have any questions about this particular course, you can email to autismmasterycourse 
at gmail.com. If you would like a complimentary booklet that I wrote called Seven Facts You Need to Know About Autism, you can text AUTISM to 66866. So uh, uh, text the word AUTISM to 66866 and you'll receive a copy of this Seven Facts You Need to Know About Autism book. And I'm always available for private consultations as well. Okay, so you can reach out um, for more information about private consults through my practice. The best email is scmedicalcenter at gmail.com. There's the phone number there, but uh, emails always work good. Um, I do in person, phone, internet consults as well. So I'm available for that type of thing as well. Okay, so if you do questions, the Great Plains will send those to me. Uh, they usually come to me via email, and I'll be able to answer back that way. Um, I appreciate everybody's attention. I hope this information was helpful for you. I know it's a lot of stuff, but uh, it's all, I think, all good. And I look forward to next month for another installment of Great Plains Labs, complimentary monthly webinars. This is Dr. Kurt Wohler. Thanks so much. Take care.